Hello and welcome to Advanced Retro Adaptics. I'm Tyler Disney. This episode is part one of an AMA, an Ask Me Anything episode. So uh, you may have noticed that recently I have not been coming out with a lot of content. I have not been making very many podcast episodes. I've not been putting out a lot of blog posts. Um, and my newsletter, which if you're not signed up for that, you should be, because uh, that's where I actually am being consistent. Uh, I, I let people know that the reason is because all of my creative energies right at the moment are going into uh, writing the book that I'm working on, and they're also going into a um, business venture that I'm on. So I made the decision to essentially shelve a bunch of other things in my life so I could focus on those two things. Once the book is done, um, I should be able to put out a lot more sort of original content. But in the meantime, I'm not putting out original stuff, and I said, hey, uh, you know, answering questions <laughs> is a uh, much smaller lift, creatively speaking, than uh, coming up with new content. So I just invited people to ask me questions on anything they wanted, and I got a bunch of really good questions. So I'm going to answer those questions, um, and hopefully you will find that interesting and valuable. So I grouped them, and in this episode, I'm going to be talking about, I'm gonna be answering the money questions, the questions that were related to money. So with no further ado, let's get into it. So Gravy with two A's asks, are you coast or lean fire or some hybrid or alternative? Do you maintain an investment portfolio? So uh, some definitions for those who may not be familiar. So fire means financial independence, retire early. Coast fire is when you save up some amount of stash and then you either get like a bread job, a part-time job that just covers your expenses while your stash grows, hopefully. Uh, and you just cross financial independence at some point down the road. Or, and then lean fire. So there's there's fire, which just means financial independence retire, retire early. Lean fire implies that you don't spend very much money, so you then don't need that big of a stash. And fat fire means you spend a fairly high amount, and so you need a bit bigger stash. So my situation just changed. Between 2021 and the beginning of this year, I was what I called semi-ERE which is closer to Coast Fire. Um, it just means that I wasn't financially independent, but my cost of living was so low that I could afford to spend only a very small amount of effort per year to pay my bills to meet my cost of living. Um, and I had a buffer of more than five years of liquid savings. So I was in a pretty like, okay state. Um, but I was focused during uh, from 2021 until early this year on skill and strategy development, on getting my costs down, on experiencing the world, on coming down from 12 years of full-time stressful employment. Um, that's kind of what I was doing. So until recently, I was kind of in a Coast Fire-ish state. Um, as of a few months ago, I'm back on an accumulate to FI path, having um, gotten an opportunity to get into a certain business venture that landed in my lap somewhat serendipitously. Uh, for those interested, I'm doing Revit MEP implementation, consulting, and asset creation. If you don't know what that means, just don't worry about it. Short version is that I'm in the process of solving money for good uh, in a short amount of time as possible, um, by which, um, which, which is, it's not that hard if you're, if you don't spend very much. So to answer that question, am I lean fire? Again, I'm not fire, but my cost of living is quite low. I, I had to look up on the internet what the definition of lean fire was, and it was any cost of living below $40,000. $40,000 seems like a lot to me. Um, my cost of living has stabilized at around $10,000. So in 2022, I spent $10,000. In 2023, I spent $10,000. And I'm on track to spend about that much uh, in 2024 as well. Um, I have what project... TTM 5K, which is my project of spending only $5,000 a year. So quick sort of side note update on that. Uh, I'm, I'm not at TTM. Five, TTM means trailing 12 month and then $5,000 expenses. Uh, yeah, my TTM is around 10. Um, I'm not at 5K. And that has partly to do with the fact that I'm spending some money on building projects and building materials and tools and things of that nature. So kind of like capital expenditures, sort of. Um, if I were to only be spending money on the necessities of life uh, that sort of feed my lifestyle, like um, my bikepacking trips and normal food and just my other normal living expenses, that would be closer to $5,000. Um, but I'm not there yet. I haven't gotten there. And I'm actually probably not going to get there in the foreseeable future because my plans are just more centered around 10K. But to answer the question, the cost of living for now 
is around 10K, and it's been that way for a couple of years. Um, last part of the question was, do I maintain an investment portfolio? I do. I run a very simple Harry Brown style permanent portfolio. And I just want to make clear that that's not advice. That's just transparency. Um, I'm not adequately financially educated nor smart enough to sleep well at night with anything other than a very conservative portfolio that doesn't require a lot of um, activity from me. Uh, yes, that means that under, if things continue the way they have been, that means that I'm leaving returns on the table that you'd get with a more aggressive 90-10 or even 60-40 allocation. Um, and I don't care. So the goal of my portfolio is not to optimize the risk to reward ratio. It is to avoid ruin. And this is actually kind of a segue on this. There's, this is the tricky part of consuming investing information as someone who considers himself a post-consumer or someone who's in a voluntary simplicity, whatever you want to think of, because most investment advice implicitly assumes that the more money you have, the better your life is going to be. And so most people who are consuming investment advice, they want to learn how to make as much money as possible, right, from their money. Um, for myself, having decoupled my quality of life from well, from amount of money I have above a certain threshold, right? Like my life is amazing. My life has never been better and I spend about $10,000, right? And I think I could have the same quality of life if I spent less, I just need to finish building some things that I wanna build. Um, but so I've decoupled it. So any any anything that really gets me above that $10,000 cost of living, roughly speaking, um, isn't actually gonna add that much to my life. But if all my money went away, then I would, that that would be a bummer. So my goal is actually to preserve the wealth, to conserve it, uh, to beat inflation, that sort of thing, um, because um, beyond that threshold that I've got, if I get, if I make more money, that's not actually going to contribute meaningfully to my quality of life, right? So I have different aims with my portfolio. Conventional wisdom doesn't apply to non-conventional sort of goals um, and worldviews. So that's something to watch out for um, when you're consuming investment advice, whether it be in books or, or whatever. But that question pairs nicely with one of Sarah's questions, which was, so Sarah says, I know you're about to become FI, but if that side hustle opportunity hadn't come up, do you think you would have indefinitely kept your FU stash rules the same as you described them in your new FU stash rules episode a while ago? I'll, I'll put a link to that. Uh, she says, I'm referring to the three to seven years of living expenses rule to only do work you like or want to do if you have at least that much living expenses. Um, so if you're not familiar with that episode and that post, um, let me recap. So I guess this was a couple years ago or maybe a year and a half ago, I came up with what I called my new FU stash rules. And the idea was to set up some heuristics such that I could make sure that I wouldn't run out of money with having a lot of advanced warning um, so that I could see, you know, financial scarcity coming from a long distance and then to, so set up some rules that I was comfortable with basically to monitor my, my, my cash bucket. And so I would have that and then I would focus on doing things that I wanted to do. I would focus on only doing activities that I felt intrinsically motivated to do. Um, and if some of those activities had as an incidental yield income, money of some sort, then, you know, that would be fine. My assumption was, what I wanted to test was, if I just do what I want, if I chase Stoke, which is one of my big things, right? If I just chase Stoke while I have a very low cost of living with buffers and runway and all this other stuff, uh, how long will it take me to get to a point where I have a financially sustainable system where I'm actually incidentally bringing in uh, in, uh, enough money that uh, pays for my lifestyle, again, which is very low cost of living, uh, and potentially a little bit more surplus so I could be moving in the direction of financial independence. That was what I set those up for. Again, the idea was that it's if and only if my FU stash bucket started crossing certain low thresholds, certain low trigger thresholds that I had, would that trigger me to seek out and be like, all right, I gotta go get a job or like do something whether I want to or not, right? Um, so not only were my rules designed to provide slack and early warning, they were designed to make space in my left life for serendipity, for things to just come at me and be like, Hey, will you do this? We'll pay you for this. And I'm like, I'd love to do that. You'll pay me. That's great. You know, that sort of thing. That was the idea. And then, um, 
serendipity happened to throw me an opportunity, uh, this business opportunity I'm doing. Um, it's something I'm good at. I enjoy it. Would I do it if I weren't getting paid for it? No, I would not. So it's not one of those things that's like money is an incidental yield. It's a primary yield of this activity. But um, the uh, I, I can earn money efficiently enough and get to that FI threshold quickly enough that I'm like, okay, this is too good to pass up. I'm just going to do this and try to solve money for good and like enjoy myself doing it and still maintain a lot of flexibility. Um, so I kind of moved away from that. But um, this is all getting at answering Sarah's, yeah, Sarah's question. Um, it just needed some context. Something that I learned when I started doing this business thing is that it's, it's one thing to say, I'm not going to think about money. I'll just let it happen incidentally. And it's another thing to actually not think about money when you're not actually sure where it's going to come from, even if you have a fairly large buffer. By large, I just mean how many years of financial resources do you have? I found that I actually thought about it more than I'd like, both consciously and unconsciously. It did influence my decisions more than I was happy with. Um, I did worry and wonder how I put together the cash flow. And, um, you know, I was going on some level of faith. It was kind of experimental. I, I knew that it might, I, I didn't have 100% confidence that it was going to work out. I wanted to see if it was going to work out. And I really noticed this. I really noticed the difference in my mindset when I got this, uh, this hustle, this business thing that I'm doing now. Um, and when I started generating that cash flow from that other thing that was efficient, all of a sudden, uh, other things in my life, my, my attitude towards them changed. Some of the things that were either throwing off incidental income or had the potential to throw off some incidental income. Once I started actually making really money, uh, real money, um, my attitude towards them changed. And that was like, oh, I was, that wasn't as incent that, that wasn't as incidental of a yield as I, as I had wanted it to be. Right. So for example, the, the, the book that I'm writing, first of all, it's a weird premise. It was a blog post that got away from me. If my aim were to make money writing a book, I would not be writing this book. I don't think it's going to do well commercially. Um, hopefully a few, few people out there get value from it. And it's just stuff that is in my head and I need to get it out, right? I want the book to exist, so I'm writing it. And that's kind of the end of the story. But I assume like, hey, I'm going to make I'm going to make this available for sale. So presumably at least my mom will buy a couple copies and I'll make some money, right? Um, but I, I, I had hoped that I wasn't making decisions about that book um, with, with potential income in mind. But once I started making money with my hustle, my attitude towards that book project did change. I, I noticed that I was writing differently. I was making different decisions about what I was writing about. And even I started to have different thoughts about how I might publish it and release it. So that was kind of an indication to me that purely incidental income generation from otherwise Stoke led activities is maybe not that easy to pull off, at least not for my brain. So yeah. I, I learned that it's not that easy to pretend to not care about money when it isn't a fully solved problem in your life. Um, so based on that insight in particular, I'm actually even more motivated to do well with this hustle and solve money for good because I want to be as decoupled as possible from the conscious and unconscious biases that income exerts on my work and my activity in the world. It's something I've talked about before, you know, if, if you have something that you do because you're intrinsically motivated to do it and then you reward it with an external reward, money, gold sticker, status, whatever, uh, that can reduce the level of stoke, the level of intrinsic motivation you have to, to do that. They've, they've done studies on that. Um, so it's, it's tricky. And so I'm starting to more fully appreciate the benefit that solving money can do now. I've never experienced having money totally solved. And what does that even mean? What does that look like? There's risk and all these other things. Uh, I'll figure that out when I get there. <laughs> I'll do another ask me anything on it. <laughs> that was a lot of words. Uh, Sarah's question was, if if you hadn't had this thing come up, do you think you would have indefinitely kept your FU stash rules the same? Here's what I assume would happen. I assume that I would have stuck with it. And within five years, either some activity that I started doing out of Stoke or an ecosystem of activities that I started doing out of Stoke would have generated more comfortably more than my cost of living. And eventually I would have built momentum towards that FI threshold. That's what I assume would have happened. It might've been a little bumpy here and there, bumpy in terms of, uh, am I really enjoying myself? 
am I really decoupled from the income that's being generated with this? Uh, but I do think it would have worked. And I think it would have worked because I spend so little money. If I spent significantly more than $10,000 a year, I think it would be very difficult and I'm not sure it would work. So Gravy asked, uh, how are you planning for money and healthcare in old age? That's a good question. So assuming things don't go to pieces, I'll have my retirement accounts, I'm fully invested in social security. So in other words, I plan on having access to all the standard money and healthcare systems that normal baseline financially responsible retirees think of as standard for the US middle class. Um, however, that's just one pillar of my sort of thoughts about old age. Um, one of the main ideas of post-consumer praxis is to have resilient lifestyle systems, right? Meaning uh, multiple means and methods of attaining the same goal. And so my goal with old age, assuming I get there, is, I don't know, for it not to be horrible. Basically, I guess that's what most people's <laughs> end of life care is. So my, my strategy with respect to healthcare, it doesn't end at just sort of conventional wealth management best practices. I currently spend and I will spend an abnormally and above average level of attention on preventative health practices, on, on just being healthy, right? The least expensive healthcare plan is not to get sick, which is kind of the joke about how the US healthcare system, <laughs> it's great so long as you're healthy. Um, and so while I do have systems in place for if I do get sick or do get injured or whatever, I, I, I'm not trying to rely on them. I'm trying to be healthy for as long as possible. Um, so I spend a lot of time on nutrition, exercise, reducing exposure to environmental toxins, maintaining a healthy lifestyle, practices to avoid lifestyle diseases and conditions, um, spending time with friends and community, all these other things. Um, yeah, in the world that I live in today, when you get too old to take care of yourself, the general path is you go through a sequence of something like in-home care, then maybe 24 seven in-home care, then you move into an old folks home where they can keep a closer eye on you, and then like the hospice, and then you go to the morgue. Depending on how things play out, you might skip a couple of those steps, right? That world might not actually exist when I myself cross the line of becoming an old folk, right? Um, or the quality of care might be extremely undesirable. It's possible that my world will look very, very different. So one thing that I'm not actually interested in doing is fearing how that future world might go and trying to accumulate a ton of wealth that I can spend when I'm like 95 or something like that or 90 or whatever uh, for a certain level of care that I think I might need to spend my own money on um, because I don't want to, I, I want to be responsible, but I don't want the, so many people who are into retirement, they oversave, right? They, they are, they essentially oversend um, how much resources they think they need for their end of life because they have a lot of fear around that. And not to say that some of those fears aren't justified, but my risk tolerance is such that I'm not going to spend an extra 10 years in my thirties and forties saving for a possible potential outcome that might be undesirable um, in my old age. So I'm trying to balance those things. Uh, one possible future scenario that by the time I'm an old folk, I've been deeply embedded in a close knit community for decades, a community that has as one of its values and practices, good, decent elder care. As a member of that community that I've been contributing to for decades to by that point, that's a key point here, that I've been embedded in and contributing to for decades, I could expect to be cared for by able younger members of that community through to the end of my life. Communities with practices like that already exist. They're few and far between, but I suspect they'll become only more common over the next several decades as people increasingly turn away or are turned away from conventional end of life care systems. So this isn't as far-fetched a scenario as it, as it might sound. However, I have to emphasize I will be taken care of by a bunch of hippies in my old age is not my plan A, that's not what I'm counting on. It's one possible future scenario that I'm taking steps to for a whole variety of reasons. Like my life might go in that direction. Again, for a whole variety of reasons, that's the sort of situation that I might find myself in. Another possibly more likely scenario is that I won't get close to there because I'm gonna get taken out by a real pandemic or a heat index event, or a wildfire, or AI is going to kill us all somehow, or a war boy with an AR, because I live in the United States, will take me out, or whatever, you know. Um, but anyways, that's that's kind of a different question. I'll get to that later. <clears throat> Gravy also asks, does your lean budget translate to a lean diet? Is a nutrition-dense and generally nourishing diet compatible with a liberated lifestyle? I'm food-attached and spend so much money on organic local foods, powders, and supplements. 
losing food optionality is a major fear in my journey towards lean. This is a great question, Gravy. I'm glad you asked this. Uh, so the short answer is a nutrient-dense nourishing diet is one of the most important elements of a solid liberated lifestyle system. And um, it ties into the question we were just talking about, like old age, like I said, like I pay a lot of attention to diet and exercise and all these other things. So a lean budget does not mean a low quality or low nutrient diet. One of the major psychological barriers to a post-consumer lifestyle is the conflation of, you know, I don't spend very much money with, I don't have very many resources, aka scarcity. Because we're so used to thinking in terms of like, if you don't have much money, you, you don't have access to anything because money is how we solve all of our problems as consumers. And that's just the water we swim in. That's the air we breathe, having grown up in this society. And so it takes a lot to sort of untrain ourselves from that. The radical truth at the core of post-consumerism is that by developing appropriate skills and strategies, your life gets more abundant in all the ways that really matter to us humans, not less. And one of the reasons for that is because money can only buy so many things. It is a, it is a uh, narrow dimension problem-solving tool. And when you bring other problem-solving tools to the issue of abundance and scarcity, you can have more things. Um, so the most important concept to hold in mind is that post-consumerism isn't really about spending very little money. It's about realizing that there are more ways to solve problems than just spending money. And that quality of life is a function, not just of money, but of money up to a certain threshold and skill understood very broadly. And when I say skill, uh, people have a tendency to think, I mean, purely technical skills, like how to change a flat tire or, you know, I don't know how to defrag windows or something like that. I mean it in as broad a sense as possible. I mean, emotional intelligence. I mean, how to have challenging conversations and how to facilitate conflict. I mean, um, care for other humans. I mean, like all the different competencies humans can have. That's kind of what I mean when I say skill. Um, but anyway, so about food. So uh, it's easy and convenient, right, to solve the, you know, I want to eat delicious, healthy, nutrient-dense food problem 100% with money because it's how our culture works. Um, that's how you solve your problems, right? But as a thought experiment, imagine that you ate just as good as just as good as you do now, but you don't spend any money at the grocery store or at the farmer's market. Like what would you have to do to eat that good if you couldn't spend money? This is a thought experiment. Stick with me here. Well, you might have to have your own garden. Let's say so you can spend money on seeds and soil and stuff like that, right? So you might have your own garden, right? or plot in a community garden. You might volunteer at the local um, organic farms and get paid in like all the produce you can carry home. You might have a good friend with chickens in their backyard and they give you some just because they're a good friend or because you help them fix their fence or something like that, right? Like you might identify all the publicly accessible trees within walking or biking distance that bear fruit and harvest them. Um, you might volunteer at a local community kitchen that gets high quality ingredients donated and take home surplus as part of the deal. Maybe you hunt, maybe you forage. Like there are, there are other ways to get food than just paying money for them. I'm not suggesting that you should try to spend zero dollars. I'm just saying that there are ways to get food that involve spending less money um, and some that actually don't involve spending money at all. They, they, they require uh, knowledge and skill and time and effort and some of these other things. And I'd also say, you know, I just mentioned, you know, a broad definition of skill. One of the skills I think is really crucial today is being able to consume information and uh, make headway with it and sort of um, parse signals and noise and what we're being told. So what I'm getting at there is that the market has figured out that healthy food is a, uh, it's a huge market. People want to be healthy. And so there are a lot of products out there. There's a lot of food out there and there are a lot of food-like mm, consumable products <laughs> that uh, market themselves as being healthy and better for you. And some of them are, and some of them are hogwash. And it can be difficult to understand the difference. And a lot of them are marked up and you know all this other stuff. So the skill, developing the skill of, um, being able to discern what's real, what's worth your time, what's worth your money, what's snake oil, etc. That's also 
a skill that will help you reduce how much money you need to spend to keep an abundant, healthy, uh, high, highly optional, to use your um, phrase, uh, relationship with food. Okay, so that was the first batch of questions. There are more questions that I'm going to be going through. That's all for now. I will be uh, doing the next ones probably in two weeks, but no promises. Um, I really appreciated the questions. Thank you for sending those in. If you are reading this and you have other questions that you'd like to ask me or this episode triggered some other questions that you have, uh, send them to me. I'm, I've got a bag now of questions, which when I have the time to be able to uh, make some content and some things, I go there, um, I, I write, I make an episode. So I, th I think this is working well. Uh, send me your thoughts, send me your questions, uh, send me your ideas, send me your comments. If you have alternative ideas to some of these questions, I'd love to hear what you have to say. So uh, do that. And until next time, take care.